Hello everyone and welcome to Mali's uh, UN Ocean Conference official site event. Uh, we apologize for the delay, we had some technical difficulties, but now let's hope that everything goes fine from this point forward. Um, uh, this, uh, today we're bringing a debate about the Antarctic, uh, microplastics, and uh, uh, conservation photography, and talk about how Portuguese researchers are reading international marine research and public engagement in ocean protection. Uh, but before we begin, uh, we, and before we give the stage to our speakers, we have a short video uh, about Mali's um, international research partners. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just to start, it, start us off, we have a presentation by Paul Paul. Paul is a researcher, he's an expert in microplastics uh, and a researcher at MARA and professor at the University of Lisbon. Her presentation will focus on the impact of microplastics in the oceans, ecosystems, and biodiversity. I'll give you the stage. Okay, awesome stuff, right? No? So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. It's a pleasure to be here and talk a little bit about uh, microplastics. So this is uh, yeah. right. So we'll talk about microplastics. So microplastics, um, microplastics are these tiny little things that you see there. So this is a zone on the beach, of course. As you can see um, many tiny little particles, different shapes, different colors. And you can see obviously that some are fragments from larger objects. And some are not fragments of large objects. The objects, for instance, the pointer. The pointer? The pointer disappears. Yes. yes. Okay. okay. So um, you have to guess, right? Uh, there are some. Uh, there are some. Uh, like this one here, for instance, you see it's kind of round. Uh, the here. There, 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 there. So this, are, this is the raw material from the industry. This is, this is what, what uh, industry, the plastics industry, uh, use for making objects, packaging uh, several objects. Uh, and they, they lose these particles and they don't care because it's very cheap. And so we get these particles then on the beach, together with the fragments, of course. So microplastics are very complex, different shapes, different colors. Uh, they have different... Um, um, materials, I say, uh, 
polyethylene, polypropylene, uh, PVC, several um, plastics. Um, and so it is quite com com uh, complex to study these. They all have different densities and uh, they absorb different, different contaminants. So it's, it's really a complex uh, issue. Uh, anyway, I would like to go back a little bit in time and then show you, show you this. Okay, so this is from Wolf who graduated in sixty seven. So this was the time when we we were not thinking of plastics at that time. We love plastics. Plastics are very convenient. And so everyone would have plastics everywhere. Pretty much like we do today, but at that time we valued the material because it was uh, really something that improved our lives. It was very convenient. Uh, but then this is when it all started, right? So it's, uh, from here on, um, uh, production started to increase a lot. And it continues to increase exponentially until today. Um, the first larger objects that you have seen before uh, that produces um, uh, smaller fragments. Some of these smaller fragments are microplastics, some are not yet microplastics, but will become microplastics in time because uh, they will break more and more and we will produce smaller and smaller particles. This is uh, these are the results of um, several expeditions actually uh, trying to map uh, small plastic debris, so it's not just microplastics, but I mean, most of it are microplastics um, uh, around the ocean. So uh, you, you do see that here we have uh, hot, uh, warm colors, we need more plastic, and uh, cool color, we need less plastic. So as it does, as it happens with the uh, with the larger objects, they try to accumulate, they tend to accumulate in these five special zones of the ocean, which are the gyres. Uh, and as you see, the biggest one is the North Pacific one. So this is what has been called uh, the great garbage uh, patch of the North Pacific. So it's like this plastic island, which of course is not an island at all, but uh, it's like a soup. Uh, and of course, it's uh, also uh, is accumulating because of the, of the coast of Asia, because there is uh, there's no waste management there, so everyone throws garbage wherever they can. Um, okay, so this was just to give you an idea that this is everywhere actually. So, uh, even in the Arctic, because uh, uh, there is this northern branch of the Devil Line uh, circulation. But apparently, it's bringing lots of microplastics to this area, the, to the parent sea. And that the, the colors again, the, what the reds are the, the <coughs> biggest mouths that they, they have found. And, and these are also, these graphs show the path that they were bringing their sampling. And so, this is the red one should be. Also, they have more plastic by weight and also by number. <coughs> and so, just to say that it's everywhere, but apparently in the Arctic, they are doing it. Uh, and this is, of course, a nice picture from the microplastics in the Arctic. <coughs> so, to give you some numbers, uh, there are lots of estimates about this, and the uh, number is probably right. But uh, uh, you can say that we have uh, every year input in the oceans are like 12.2 million tons a year of plastic. Uh, and it's increasing, of course. Um, but this plastic, most of it comes from land, so it's land based. Uh, it's uh, also mainly comes from its 9 million, also 9 million tons of plastic. From the coastal areas, coastal zones, and a little bit in lands. Um, and then 
there is a maritime origin also, sea-based sea plastic, mostly uh, because of uh, fisheries and transportation. Transportation now accounts for like 90% of all transportation in the world, so it's done by, uh, by, by sea, so it's uh, really making it even worse. Um, this is another graph so so showing uh, how much waste, how much plastic was produced until 2015. So uh, it's a huge amount of plastic, it's not a very easy number of uh, But you can see that uh, um, half of it, so production 8.3 million tons, half of it was produced after 2002, so it's very recent, really increasing exponentially. Um, so it generates a lot of waste, of course, so it's under 6.3 million tons. And uh, what is more worrying about this is that uh, only 9% is recycled. So we have this uh, um, energetic polarization uh, uh, of uh, waste, and then you have landfills. Um, but in fact, the, the amount of recycling is very little. So when you, when you hear, oh, yes, recycling, we are going now to recycle a lot of plastics. Still needs a lot of improvement. And um, also, uh, for landfills, uh, there are um, many ways, lots of ways that it doesn't get to the landfill. So it's mismanaged, as we say, so it's dispersed in the environment. And of course, these calculations are very difficult to, to make, and so it's not always tested. This is a very known quote uh, about this 8 million tons a year of plastic into the ocean every year. So, this is with data from 2010. So, now it's supposed to get a little bit more. Uh, but also, calculations they, they say that uh, 474 million tons will be mismanaged and will be accumulated by now in the ocean. And so, this is fresh of course this happens not it doesn't happen here of course this happens in the uh, in the uh, in the countries of the tropical belt you know they have all these um, tourist activities and they, they need to import uh, the people that uh, the things that the tourists need and they want there so they import everything but then they don't have any waste so they bury the garbage, they, uh, they put it out of sight, of course, everything is very But then when the heavy rains that they get, everything. So this is to say that also, Poverty is also uh, what is driving uh, many of these situations that we need to end poverty. So, microplastics, uh, primary microplastics, which are those which are um, built to be very, very small or enter the environment in these uh, sizes, which are below five millimeters. So you can think of, um, you can think of, uh, Tire dust, which apparently is the most important source of microplastics in the environment, if you, if you speak of all the tires that there are in the world. Um, the pellets from the industry, the, the, the tiny little spheres that are shielded in the beginning. So the industry just loses its, its raw material. The industry doesn't care because it's very cheap. And they just, um, well, it would be very easy uh, to contain this within the within factory or within uh, trucks that. Uh, uh, press of these materials to the, the factory. Uh, and there is a, even a campaign for the industry to do this, but it's a voluntary campaign. So it's, it's, it's voluntary, so very few uh, businesses have um, signed this. So they continue to lose their pellets. Um, the next slide, of course, is the fibers. We are losing fibers in our synthetic clothing uh, every time we wash them. Uh, and the paints, we sometimes don't think about this, but the paint that we, we paint our buildings and our ships and our and even the roads. So now I see here in the middle lots of roads painted 
the big roads, the big uh, streets, whatever, these are producing microplastics. You produce microplastics to, to, to the ocean. So it's really not a good option. Uh, and of course, uh, of course there's, uh, what I did here is uh, cosmetics. So the, the micro bits that are intentionally added to uh, personal care products, uh, which will be phased out soon. Apparently, there is uh, some more here in Portugal that will be in place in, I think it's the 1st of July. Um, that will um, forbid this introduction, this intentional introduction of uh, microbeads. These are very, very small spheres, uh, polythene most of the time, uh, and uh, they are used in exfoliants and stuff. Or shampoo in your uh, shower gel, in your toothpaste, get those, those things. Um, okay, so this, this is some data also about, uh, about sources and seeds of green litter. Uh, Sources in six and very little. Uh, I don't always like to mention this because um, the ocean surface only accounts for 1% of all the litter. So, what you see at the surface is like the tip of an iceberg. So, all the litter is in the bottom already, so it's 94% from these are estimates again, and 5% on beaches and coastal areas. So really, what, we, what, what shocks us when we see uh, in, the, in the ocean, it's really nothing compared to what we have there below. Um, okay, so what happens to a microplastic when it enters the ocean? So there's lots of uh, bacteria and virus and things there. So all these animals will come to the plastic. They will colonize it. They will build a biosphere. Uh, and this is actually an ecological succession, so it starts with bacteria and bacteria, microalgae, fungi, fungi, fungi um, and all these real animals. So, this is what happens. So, it's covered in organic matter. Uh, and of course, and also other organic matter that is already in the, in the water, that is not live. Uh, live. Um, and also absorbs some minerals, some clay and silts. That are in suspension in the water because they are very uh, small. Um, and so all this covers the microplastics. Some of the ordinary into the biofilm, um, they uh, excrete this gas, the EMS, into uh, sulfide, which is one of the components of the smell of the sea, Portuguese in Mercia. Okay, so this uh, fools all the animals, so they think this is. I believe it. Now, this is the back part. It also absorbs pollutants that are already in the water because they can be um, uh, discard, discarded, discarding all these, all these chemicals for, for decades. And some of them are even not uh, having a band and they are not, uh, they are not producing anymore, but they are. Persistent and we still get them like the EE, for instance, and other. So, this group of organic pollutants is called EOP, uh, and they are uh, hydrophobic. So, when we see plastic, they just go there. And metals, and metals. Ah, one minute. One minute. <laughs> uh, and this is wrong, additives. So at the same time that they absorb all these pollutants, um, they uh, eliminate these additives because there is a slow degradation of plastic that releases all these additives. So this is toxicity, red, and then what happens? Plastics can be ingested and translocated within the body of the animal, and they can uh, they can go to, to the bottom because when they are colonized, their density increases. So even the plastics that generally float, with time, they will sink. So the, the, test, the, the, the final, um, uh, final destination of the plastic will be water. And then they will continue to fragment, and they will continue to produce by little particles, and of course, we are having nanoplastics in the ocean, though we still don't know how, because it's very difficult to measure that. Okay, so uh, now this is just uh, to show some of the particles that we find in coastal waters here in Portugal, fibers and 
This is a microbit, you have a sphere there. Uh, there are lots of uh, uh, different uh, polymers, polyethylene, polypropylene, polyester, lots of fiber, polyester from the clothing, polyethylene is nylon, you know, there are lots of, lots of polymers here. This is in the sediments, it's more diverse. Uh, you can see a, a glitter, a piece of glitter there, it's a star, it's a star. Uh, you can have microbits too, you can have everything. And now the pigment. I was uh, wanting to show you about ingestion, so I chose this, uh, this work that uh, was in collaboration with uh, Javier. Uh, so we were looking at, uh, at the three species of pigments and at their scats, and we find uh, microbuses there. So this is to say that people in the Southern Ocean, what well, I'm showing you later before, you get this microbuses. So it's fibers, uh, it's uh, fibers, it's fragments, um, and they are there. Of course, not all the scats will have microplastics, but they are there. And we, they are in fish also, in the fish that you eat. And this is also here in Portugal. So the, the, the fish that eat the most is the uh, horse mackerel and the mackerel from our studies, of course, but there are plenty of other species that already ingest. Um, and so, of course, you don't eat stomachs, of course, it's true. You take, but still, there's a conflict. And then we have this problem with human health. So, of course, that, uh, uh, now we know from uh, recent publications that there are microplastics in our blood, so it's circulating. And then we also know that there are microplastics deep in our lungs. So it's not something that is here, it's very deep in our lungs. And several polymers, several types of different plastics. So this is really happening. It's not really a surprise. We were expecting it, but now uh, there is evidence. We don't know still though what are the effects. That's the next step. Okay, so this is a prediction for 2060. So it's going to be one to have three times more plastic than in the scenery in a, a business as usual. Because nothing is done, so this is going to be really bad. Uh, then we have many challenges, which I just chose science, science and technology, policy, legislation, and circular economy, which is now very popular, um, and education and literacy. So we can, we can uh, design new models, new enzymes that we have the capability of degrading faster all the classes, students study. Uh, we have uh, probably, we can develop biodegradable plastic that has the properties that we need. Because we can we can do it, but sometimes the properties are not those that we need. It's not good. There are campaigns against uh, microspheres in the in the cosmetics, like the microbit, and there are lots of removal oceans uh, actions uh, in removal in the oceans also, uh, and in rivers, and in beach cleanups, etc. There are uh, there are um, plastics that can be recycled, as you know, but very few. Most of them are not recycled. And when they are not recycled, they just end up in this kind of picture that we have there, uh, these plastics. And then sometimes they are converted in benches and in the walkways uh, in which they, they are painted, they are colored the wood, so they imitate wood. And, and, and this is sometimes you think it's a good thing, but on the other way, it will be produced by the plastics in our world. So it's uh, not, not a very good thing. Okay, so I'm going to go. So, to try and find a solution to this, we have to, to target the entire plastic cycle. So, not just removal, we need to go a bit further. <coughs> we have to restrain uh, plastic demand and circularity. There are several uh, laws and uh, documents, uh, strategic documents from the EU um, saying this about circular economy, though. Uh, it still has a, a long way to go, and as recycling is absolutely a must, uh, we have to recycle more. Uh, and of course, we have to eliminate the leakage because there are many, many plastics that uh, escape the waste management system. That is when the waste management management system exists, which is not in, in all the parts of the world, it's just in the developed world. And on top of this, we really must. Uh, have and reduce production of plastic. Otherwise, if you just do the what's what's below, it's not going to happen. We must stop using as much as we do. Uh, 
Uh, I'm uh, okay. One more minute. Okay. <laughs> Uh, this is because I think it's important because when you reduce the marine pollution and plastic pollution, the whole pollution in general, you are really addressing a lot more than the SDG 14, which is, I know what Dr. Lisa said, like the water, right? But you are also uh, promoting good health and well being, right? You need clean water and sanitation. Why? Because many of this pollution that you get in the ocean comes from the rivers, come from so we need to provide clean water and sanitation to everyone. And also we need to promote inclusive and sustainable economic growth. Because uh, pollution is, as I said before, associated with poverty. And people uh, that uh, live on waste, they are waste pickers or something. And this should end, of course, should be a better way of living. And, and of course, when you, when you reduce plastics, you are also achieving sustainable uh, consumption and production. And also, uh, this is very important. This is probably the most important of the most because so much problem is also partnerships. They cannot be it alone. It's impossible because it's a problem when everyone is guilty. Everyone has to take part in the solution. Um, and of course, this is uh, something that we hope is going to bring us uh, to a good uh, situation in the future. So, this is a global uh, plastic uh, treaty that has been approved uh, recently in March. And uh, hopefully, in 2024, this is when everything will be negotiated. This is just starting in all the countries in the world. Because it's very important that they are uh, agree, they, are, they, they can do concerted actions, and uh, but this has many uh, sides to be done, not for them to do the discussion. And of course, that's all my notion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, and now we have uh, Jesse here. Uh, He's also a researcher in Mali and a professor at the University of Cambridge. His presentation will be focused on the ecology of the Antarctic. Thank you, Vian. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Paula, for the good introduction. Um, what I, I'd like to have a snapshot is the relevance of the Southern Ocean to address some of the issues that we're talking about all three this week on the United Nations Oceans Conference. The topic that, that Paula mentioned is one of the hot topics during the week. The agreement that she's just mentioned, bringing all the countries together, is extremely hard. And even we're talking about 2022, today, we haven't achieved it yet. So it takes a long, long time. We're talking about decades to sort it out. My main point here is to reassure that the science that we do in Portugal has global importance, and including our and mine. One thing that is very important when we're talking about the polar regions is that not only it's important and relevant, like I will show you, but thank God is also pretty nice. We actually find nice to do research there. We don't have any icebergs, but just going there and witnessing, for example, and finding out microplastics, this actually has been quite a big surprise. It's quite known as to be a, a natural laboratory to understand some of these processes. And even more, there's some issues that are quite relevant from an ocean's perspective that we've been discussing this week. Just an example, just to get there, it's a nightmare. It's highly costly. There's no cities, there's no towns, there's no shopping malls. Thank God there's no wars in the Antarctic. But can you imagine us as, as working in marine biology? How oh, oh, would be difficult to collect samples using nets in these regions? Logistically, it's very expensive to have the ships, to have the stations, to have the planes to go there. So when we're talking about collecting data like on microplastics, when we get these samples, Actually, they cost a lot of money. 
And what we're discussing all day this week is that we're talking about and bringing together more than 119 countries with their own challenges nationally. And we need to look at in a holistic way, in a big, big way. The animals that live there, therefore we find, well, some of them find as Paul mentioned if they're very plastics. And there's a lot of threats because they, if you don't see it, you're not aware of it. This is not just to show off. One of the reasons that other than just the science is that in terms of communication, now we have research teams in Portugal that actually go to the Arctic and the Antarctic to do some of this leading research that can have world implications. And I'll show some of these examples. But you can, and it's something that's been mentioned already this week, we can inspire generations using macroplastics, using marine biology that most of them do. And we need to use it. The Antarctic is far away, yes, but it's 10 percent of the planet. It has three to five kilometers of ice. If you remove it, we have truly a matter of mountains just are totally unaware of. Of course, they will have minerals. And we've been talking about it already this week. But something like, for example, under the Antarctic Treaty, that is not allowed at the moment. But we're talking about, for example, in marine life, we have, for example, in terms of fish, we're talking about 80 to 90 percent of species that are endemic. They are from there, and they don't exist anywhere else. And if we're talking about the Antarctic, we have to talk about climate change. Like it was emphasized yesterday at the opening ceremony by Antonio Guterres, emphasizing that sea level rise is one of the big issues that we're going to face. The Antarctic will have a major role in that. And I'll show you. Also, to the levels of the Antarctic to the rest of the planet is quite huge. That has been reported in the IPCC reports, Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change reports. This is the concept paper that we're talking about these issues about biodiversity and management that we're talking about the oceans. In the Antarctic, we are ruled by the Antarctic Treaty that brings more than 50 countries about to manage this area as they well can. But we're talking about sea level rise, issues like ocean acidification or climate change, or working these polar regions that are challenging in terms of logistics, and marine protected areas. Yeah, I'm going to give you some examples. We can lead through the Southern Ocean, the processes that can happen there could affect other else in the world. And we are analyzing various threats, how we work at Mare, as she looks at the marine food webs, and trying to understand how these issues of climate change or pollution, how that relates to fisheries management, how we can do it in a more holistic, broad way to preserve it in an efficient way, and the example elsewhere. And is really the sea level rise? really affecting the rest of the planet. This is a model by Rob. Rob showed that within 100 years, the sea level rise can increase a lot. And this is just an example. If the temperatures keep on increasing, we know already starts in terms of what the audience is going to happen. Because the, the ice, the snow melted in all of Florida, we're talking about the sea level rise increasing by 60 meters. If that ever happens, will be dead already before. So we are not reaching this at all. But we're talking about there some signs, for example, in the Northern Peninsula, and now, very recently, the last three years, in Eastern Antarctica, that we never thought they would not, that climate change would have affected. It's too big. We're talking about the size of the Earth. It's huge. And we're talking about the sea level rise increasing. These 60 meters means this tower, means this building. It's not something tiny. And when we're talking about climate change, we are aware as a community that it's not just happening. Yes, it happened, and it already started. So do we our friends from Tuvalu? They are already under our water. They are already suffering. And they are around. They are in Lisbon with the water above them and saying, we need to do something about this. But again, we can't do it alone. As, as Paul mentioned, we have to do it in a cooperative way, either addressing microplastics or climate change. When we talk about biodiversity, we also have to be very careful. Are we talking about species level? Are we talking about populations? This is an example of the baby penguins in the Caribbean that actually think they work really down through time. But actually, if you work on the baby penguins on the Ross Sea, on the other side of the Antarctica, actually the populations are quite general. So, for example, in terms of policy, we have to be careful. Should we do it at population level? Should we look at that species level? 
how far do we go? And we need to adjust this according to the species or the existence that we should look at. So we have to be very careful when we talk about policies. And for example, looking at the future, we predicted that even in the low scenarios, that you've done everything really well, or a high emission scenario on the IPCC, that is business as usual, what we are doing at the moment, that in the next 50 years, the sea level rise, just the contribution of the Antarctic will be 27 centimeters. Just to give it a context, the sea level rise at the moment is increasing to 2 to 3 millimeters. 2 to 3 millimeters. Antarctica will contribute 27 centimeters in the next 50 years. That hasn't come for yet. 27 million centimeters is huge. And the hard predictions, which you can see in the worst, is 27 centimeters in when we wrote the paper. Now it's higher. And even worse, in the scenario we're in, we will have a major impact in policy and governments, and some of these processes in terms of sea level rise can become irreversible. What it means is, as soon as the, the, the ice shells actually kind of melt, they won't be rebuilt. They keep on melting more and more and more, and the glaciers will be this more water. So it will all be higher. And even worse, Stephen and Cassandra made a really nice review that showed that in terms of the changes that we witnessed in the Antarctic, is so high that in terms of policies, we are not keeping the pace. We are too slow. From writing the paper to define and designate a very protected area or trying to create a law to protect some parts of the Antarctic, we are too slow. Even if we have scientists working as policies and uh, as policy makers, too slow. Even working directly with the Antarctic Treaty, having the papers to get together an agreement and bringing more than the 50 countries together to have this agreement, it's very hard. Bringing everyone together to have this agreement, like a general agreement on, on plus and pollution in the existence. Things are getting too slow. We need to address urgency. And this week, what we're doing is actually looking, not only looking at the problems, it's what we can do, what actions should we do, how we implement them, and implement them, and how we review them regularly to make sure that it's succeed. And the party can be an example. Just last month, we were in Berlin, and at the latest Antarctic like, Treaty Consultant meeting, and one thing that really snaps up, and it really comes up really nicely with what happens with the United with Nations conference that we have, is cooperation is essential. We can't do it alone. It's like Father mentioned. It's not one country. It's not, it's not even EU. It's actually global. We have global actions. There's some urgency, for example, in terms of our modeling and the impact on the Antarctic. Not only we need more data, we need to reduce uncertainty on our models. How is sea level actually increasing? What mitigation measures can be applied in New Guinea, in Angola, in Japan? Because the impact will be poor. And reinforced in terms of research, it has to be conserved, either in Portugal or in China. And the United Nations here, we talk about actions, they will cost. And we knew to know the actions, we need the science. And needs to be reinforced by the research that we do uh, in Mare with the other organizations as well in terms of the science. One thing that has been reinforced also in the United Nations is the relevance of the science that we do and the policies that we develop are based on evidence from scientists. And you think, yes, of course, but we have evidence in various cases that geopolitics goes above this, and it's a problem. Let's hope that this week we become uh, a solution. And when we're talking about, for example, one example, the Antarctic Treaty, and it actually has been an example worldwide, is very protected areas. Really more than 50 countries to agree that the first international marine protected area was in mind was this area is quite well. And now you're thinking, who cares? Why should we care about this little piece of marine protected area in international waters? First, it was the first. And secondly, everybody agreed. It took, that was the first in 2009, and then the Ross Sea 
What's the second one? 2016. Again, everybody agreeing on the marine protected area. But we have this really nice um, uh, article in the, our national newspaper by Atlantic Physician for the 2030 goal of 30% of protected areas. They are practically essential to that. Why? Just the last thing, you see, she's trying to Portugal, it's the size of, the, of Angola. It's huge. So it's something that we can learn from the Antarctic, working collectively to actually have a major resolution. But I'm really happy that we feel and we're getting into these international agreements in protecting uh, the ocean only in a cooperative way. And that is something that we really fall in tracking. It's really the tracking of single span of solid phosphorus. And if you find within the Antarctic, as I mentioned, 10% of the planet, if it's 10%, I mean, particular, uh, marine protected areas everywhere would be very difficult. So to overcome that, we track them and they define where do they go? Because where they go is where it's more ecologically more around us. So we can define that it's on these regions. These areas are the areas that need to be protected, that we can help manage, for example, in competition with fisheries and tourism, for example. But these areas are only covered by only 30%, one third of the protected areas. I'm not thinking here say that everything should be protected. I mean that we have to manage both the needs as in humans to have fisheries, but also to make sure that we have enough food in the long-term perspective. We also should look in a very broad way things that action plans from the regulations that you have that we work together uh, in the last couple of years and we are involved in the resilient and healthy ocean uh, that we focus most on actions regarding uh, the biology and the ecology and monitoring of these areas. We're working together also and I should reinforce this the need, and Portugal is doing that, Mata is doing that, to make sure that we enforce the younger generation of earlier scientists on real some of these issues. Our expedition was just pre-COVID, but it's really important to have an average running standards to make sure that these, these people, these early career scientists, will advance much of the knowledge that we have now, so that much of these policies will come through much quicker. Bringing the scientists into policy is essential. And this is my message to all of you. It's just what we are doing this week is truly important and you can make a difference and putting Mare and Portugal on the map. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, our, next, our next and final guest speaker is Nobi and he's also a researcher at Mari and a professor at the Polytechnic Institute of Mari. Okay, thank you. Um, so, I started uh, diving fairly early in life. Um, it was my way to explore the underwater world that always fascinated me. I became a marine biologist to better understand it. And later on came photography, which was the, the tool that I found to communicate with the others the wonderful things that I was seeing in the water, but also the uh, threats that the oceans were facing today. One of the first underwater photos that I took was in Berlingas, a marine protected area about 60 miles north of Lisbon. And I photographed this animal and I had no idea what it was. A couple of days later, um, a researcher helped me uh, identify this animal, and he said this was a, an anemone, but not the typical anemone as we usually, um, usually see that live attached to the rocks and have a lot of tentacles. So it's quite uh, a little bit different. Now, the interesting uh, thing about this, uh, this anemone is that uh, this was the northernmost record of this uh, animal um, until date. So, this represented the, the, the far more uh, north in terms of latitude that this animal would find because it's typical from uh, tropical areas. Now, if you dive in the same place uh, today, you can easily spot four or five of these uh, animals in one dive alone. And the same is true 
for other groups of animals such as fish, uh, algae, coral. It's a uh, phenomenon that uh, scientists call tropicalization of disease, and it's a typical sign of global warming. Now, I've chosen this photo as it represents another of the threats that uh, our, our oceans face today, which is ghost fishing. So, ghost fishing is defined as any uh, fishing device that is discarded or lost, and that basically stays in the sea and, and fishing uh, um, constantly and forever, until in marine life. Now, uh, this two puffer fish, after I took this photo uh, back in 2017, in the paper uh, they would eventually have died if they had not been released and the trend brought to shore to prevent any more mortalities. Now, this photo was actually taken last week in the Azores, and you can see the tip of Peak Island in, in, in the background. So, this is a juvenile loggerhead sea turtle, uh, relatively common in the Azores. Now, 90% of the loggerhead population are born in the beaches of Florida, in the United States. Now, um, these animals, once they hatch, the first thing they do, they rush to the sea, they enter the ocean, and they embark uh, in the biggest adventure of their lives, which is the crossing the Atlantic Ocean. So, benefiting from the Gulf Stream, they get to the Azores, Madeira, and Canary Islands, and they live in this, in this region for quite some, for some years, uh, eventually returning back to the West Atlantic to reproduce. Now, uh, as you can imagine, this uh, the journey is extremely, extremely dangerous, exhausting, and most of these animals are, uh, once they reach the Azores um, region, they're uh, extremely exhaust, they're malnourished, dehydrated. And thanks to a, a group of organizations working together in the Azores, it is possible to rescue some of these animals, to rehabilitate them, and eventually return them back to the ocean. Now, researchers from the University of the Azores take advantage of these uh, opportunities and tag some of these turtles. You can probably see a really small um, tag in this, this turtle carapace that is powered by uh, solar uh, power. So this, this researcher is releasing the turtle and we will be able to, to, to track the movements of this turtle and better understand their ecology so they can better establish um, 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 measures to protect them. Now, speaking of long migrations, is a here's a, a mobile array, so relative, relative to relative, related to the to the manta rays. Um, this species is endangered and has been the subject of um, study for of scientists for many years now. Now, what scientists do know that is that particularly in Portugal, in this species, mobile trapacana, the Chilean devil ray, uh, forms large aggregations, particularly in the top in the, on the top of sea mounds in the Azores Islands. This typical scenario you would see on the top of, uh, of one of these seamounts, the Ambrosio of San Maria Island. Um, you can easily see 40 or 50 of these animals in, in the, on the top of, of these seamounts. Now, these animals usually stick around during the summer months. So, from July to uh, late September, you go to these seamounts and you usually hang out there. So, this is the perfect um, scenario for scientists to study this typically oceanic animal. So basically, they stay there for three, three months, and the, the scientists can observe them, take notes, and better understand their functional ecology. Back in 2018, uh, I flew to, to Santa Maria Island, and I had a chance to follow uh, Anna Filipe Sproul, who is a researcher from the University of the Azores, and she's doing a, her PhD with the manta rays in the North Atlantic. And there's, uh, there's Anna Filipe Sproul uh, diving. And she's holding, uh, what she's holding in her hand is a biopsy pole. So she uses that pole to collect a sample, um, uh, so a tissue sample of the manta rays. And she can use that sample to, on, on, their, on their genetic studies and better understand the population structure of these animals. Now, one of the things, one of the first things that Anna Flip asked me when I got to the Azores was to photograph the ventral side of, 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 of the mobulus, of the belly of the mobulus. And the reason is that uh, Anna Filippa created a, a very um, genius uh, citizen science uh, initiative called Manta Catalog Resource. You can look it up uh, on the internet. And then basically, like I said, it's a citizen science program, and she encourages uh, divers that go in the water and, 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 and find manta rays to photograph 
the, the, the other side, the ventral side, the belly of these rays, and she uses that gray pattern that you see uh, in the posterior side, in, in near the tail. That ventral pattern is unique for it, for each individual, so it works like a fingerprint. So having contributors from a little bit of in all the Atlantic. Uh, providing photos of these mobile arrays in different places. Uh, with all this information together and all this network, I don't think they might be able to better understand their uh, migratory movements. And again, better uh, be able to uh, establish uh, conservation initiatives for these animals. Now this photo I've chosen, as I, I think it's, uh, it represents one of the main threats that sharks face um, nowadays which is spinning, so the act of removing the shark fins. Um, so this is a, a relatively common um, practice throughout the world, and basically it is, this is done to feed the, 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 the Asian market for the famous shark fin soup. So the finning uh, uh, um, act is extremely cruel. So basically, they, they, the, the fishermen get the shark, they cut their fins out, and often they release the rest of the they throw the rest of the body overboard quite often while the animal is still alive. So that basically will go through that will go through the, the, the shark's head and basically lodge uh, right behind right behind the, the pectoral fins, as you can see there. Now, what's really interesting and really revolutionary about this tag is that that harness uh, it's got a, a galvanic ring that once in contact with salt water, it starts dissolving. So in between 24 hours to 48 hours, it will be completely dissolved and the iron will basically open and all the device will, will float back to the surface and the research can collect and download all the information and better understand where the sharks are moving, their, their movements, if they're interacting with areas of fishing, areas of pollution, and again, to better understand uh, their, their, their ecology, and to better be able to detect it. Now, since we're in the Azores, um, I would like to talk about marine protected areas, which was, which is one of the most popular tool, tools to protect uh, marine life, uh, especially in this archipelago. Now, this, this photo was, was taken in one of the most remote places, Portugal, which is the Formigas Islands of uh, uh, São Miguel Island. Now, there's a something very peculiar about diving in, in Formigas Islands. There's a, a, a spot uh, where you can see basically these guys, the dus dusky groupers, and you see a lot of them in a really big size dusky groupers. Now, this is one of the most iconic species that um, you can see in Portuguese waters. Um, once it was relatively common, common throughout the mainland, the islands, all the Mediterranean, coast of Africa, even South Brazil, it was relatively common. Nowadays, you basically see them almost inside the river there. These animals have been overfished and overfished. They're now in danger. And we run the risk of getting them extinct in a few years. Now, diving in, in, in Formigas, uh, I'd say it's like a, um, a trip to the past. It's like going back in time, where you can see these animals absolutely in harmony with nature, and uh, what, what, which is something like, it would happen about 100 years ago or 200 years ago. And so my final message is, is, is simple and I think it's clear. The oceans are resilient, but we also have to do our part. This if we want our children, our grandchildren, to be able to you know the dusky groupers, the blue sharks, loggerhead sea turtles, and not just from photos. Thank you. And we'll now move on to our question. Uh, so, first, I'm going to open to the people. If anyone has questions for our guests, what are your expectations for this week, for this conference? Uh, do you think there's going to be like, some decisive uh, decision? Yes. Uh, um, I, I was discussing that with Nuno. Um, before the conference itself, 
I, I thought it would be a, a lot of noise because it's 7,000 people, side events every two minutes, uh, a lot of delegations, a lot of geopolitics. So I was, I was just feel that it would be just a huge circus and there will be no, no really concrete actions. But I was honestly, after a couple of days, I was totally wrong. I was, I was very positive that from a political perspective, um, they were talking about identifying the problems, giving suggestions of actions, and they were giving advice on policy that they just achieved in the last couple of years. And I was very impressed. Uh, so it means that uh, not only keep me happy that Portugal is leading a lot of the way, but in terms from all the stakeholders involved in the discussions, they are very constructive. And we feel, or I felt, that everybody is starting to push in the right direction in understanding what are the problems and the threats of the oceans. And collectively, we need to take action. And I think he's portraying a lot in the first two days. So I find that I'm, I'm very positive. I think the declaration at the end of the week will be a good declaration. It's pushing us in the right direction, but also realizing there's a lot of work to do, a lot. And when we put giant politics into this, it feels that you have a range of countries doing a little bit in the right direction. The majority as in is still a thing. It is a problem, we need to do it, but we still don't know why. And I think we need the scientific community to provide that guidance. Yeah. And also, I think that uh, it will be, I mean, because this, this is always also a matter of uh, funding, right? Because there are very different countries that are very different in their economies. And so I think um, I had heard it yesterday that uh, um, the creation of mechanisms to be able to finance these countries is that for this is to do waste management systems that we don't have any. So I think, I think exactly like uh, uh, Jose was saying, that we are moving in the same direction. Also, I feel that that's very personal. I feel a lot of energy here. So it's um, because there's so many people and uh, we will all want to do something. Uh, even sometimes if you listen to things that you know this is not going to take so long, but there's lots of energy there, so I, I am hopeful that something good will come out of it. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm totally with what you're saying. Well, I, I had a chance to be here for a few moments yesterday. I mean, it's like the pleasure to say it's so much stuff happening at the same time. It's so many different places. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the energy is definitely uh, very positive, and uh, the feedback I've been having from a lot of people uh, working in uh, higher um, places is, is definitely good. I mean, we're all, I think we're all a bit skeptical about this, this conferences and meetings. We've seen so much and not, not actually uh, having uh, practical results. But, but yeah, uh, I mean, we, we have to. This is, well, we talk every once about the war in Ukraine, of course. It's also a war. We're actually losing it. So it's, it's, it's time to act. And yeah, I'm, I'm, most of all, I'm very hopeful about this issue. I have a follow up question to this one. Uh, do you feel that we are doing this on time or are we already too late to the front of the poll? Well, we don't know which thing the question will be said to the But what do you think? Are we on time or are we? Already doing this a bit later than we should have done it. Oh, we're way behind. Let's have a Yes. 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 I, I, I don't think we are too late. I think we are just late. The cinema already started and it already, you know, they are halfway of the movie. And we don't know how the movie was going to end. What I find it from a scientific perspective is that, well, we are a research institute is that the evidence has been there for numerous years. So we are aware of the evidence. Uh, the problem is on transmitting that to governments and governments to act. We have to be conscious that being part of the solution is also engaging in communicating well the science to these governments. And this, I think, is taking too much time. What I found refreshing from Antonio Guterres yesterday and all the politicians is that they're recognizing that we're already too late, <laughs> like, like you mentioned incorrectly. Uh, not too late in the sense that 
we should have started, is in that sense. Uh, I totally agree with Nunu and Paula. I, I think we, we should keep a very positive note to what is happening at the moment and what is happening this week. I think it's truly important. And I think we are, we are getting later and later because what it means is that in terms of mitigation and actions, what actions are you going to take? They will be more costly. The mitigation measures will be more will cost more, and uh, the actions in terms of solutions will also cost more. So, if we are, for example, the morning the session of this morning was about the needs in terms of policies on less developed countries. Those are the ones that have poverty. Those are the ones that have more problems economically. So, those are ones that probably, if they are a small country, then are an island on the ocean, they will suffer more. So those are the ones that are yelling higher <laughs> in the conference. And we should do that together. We should do it in a cooperative way, in an international way, in agreements that are internationally binding, and we should do it together. But I think for us, from the scientific community, we are already giving all the evidence that they need. Now we just need the, the technological tools and keep working and adding more pieces to the science, but also reinforcing these actions. One final point. We're talking about actions, but implementing them and review them regularly to see if they actually factor is a major issue. The other issue that I find essential is, Paula mentioned, money. Money for the science, money for the mitigation measures and adaptation measures, particularly the ones that will suffer more. Issues like climate change, ocean signification, plastic pollution, these are all global. So everybody will go on board. I think we just need to help the ones that are less prepared so that they will also be part of the ship on sorting it out. If you don't do it alone, the poorest countries will keep on putting their plastics to the rivers and, and they say, sorry, we have poverty to sort. We have so many other issues. So I, 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 I have a very good, I don't think we are too late. But the later we get, the more possible will be. Well, I basically stole wrong words. <laughs> I totally agree. <laughs> that really bridges scientists and scientific community to policies. I'm, I'm, I'm like you said, it's absolutely crucial. And like you said, it's been the weeks thing, this first time, a lot of developments in that area. And I think that's absolutely crucial. We have to better communicate with politicians. I think we haven't done it. That well, so yeah, I think we also need to uh, they also said that about evidence. Of course, we have been given every evidence about many things, but th there are still many, many things that uh, are found. For instance, uh, thinking about uh, recycling, about uh, circular economy of plastics, there are still not so much evidence about the solutions. And sometimes you can go forward with the solution without thinking very much how is it going to happen and how is it going to develop and sometimes uh, it's a mistake that we should have talked before so uh, I think we need to provide uh, governments with this evidence so that they can uh, go through with the solutions otherwise we will have like paper cups with a plastic inside and then you don't know what to do with that so it's, it's one of those things. No, anyone else has a question? Okay, then I have a question for Paul. Uh, the, when we're talking about microplastics, and the, plastic sheets, the, the, the focus has been set on the, on the user, for our role as consumers. Don't you think that uh, that should change a bit, not only for consumers, but also to have a focus on the companies producing the plastic and the government's conscious I think I think it's not something about the consumer. I think that's, that is a whole idea. Because uh, for many years, uh, the industry would, uh, would say, oh, I have nothing to do with it. It's the consumer that uh, litters everything they do what they should do and whatever. Uh, but that has changed. That has changed in the last years. So the industry now is in the ocean. So they, they ignored for decades the amounts of plastic in the ocean. They didn't care. They still don't care about the little particles that they lose. Uh, but they are more aware that they must do something. Also because of their image. Uh, and also because there are rules, they have to comply with uh, the directives. They, they, there is a strategy in the EU for the plastic recycling economy. There is a directive to plastics, 
and they have to change the way they do, they do business and they have to close the cycle. So they have lots of, uh, uh, they have to change a lot of things and they are pretty aware of it. So they are now wanting to be part of the solution. Uh, and I think this is a issue with the final. And what can the public, what can the public do to pressure uh, all the governments and governments to do Well, it depends a lot, you know, because this is the market. So if, uh, uh, the industry also says that all the time, it's, it's saying that, uh, oh, we give the consumers what they need or what they want. What's the point of doing a uh, material that then well, I cannot sell it because the people won't buy it? But it's not true because we all we can only uh, make uh, sustainable choices if, if we have options. And if you don't have options, of course we are not going to do so. If, if, uh, if a baby wants to be eating chocolate all the time, we're not going to be chocolate all the time, right? So it's the same thing. <laughs> um, so, um, also, there is a good example of a, of a campaign. This is uh, the, the microbit campaign. Uh, this was started in, uh, in the Netherlands uh, by an NGO, an NGO called the uh, Plastic Suit Foundation. And they, uh, they started this, I can't remember exactly, maybe 2015 or 14, or maybe before, I don't know. Uh, but they, they have been very success successful uh, because uh, Without any scientific evidence of harm done by these tiny little particles in the exfoliants and the shower gel or anything, they led the people, the industry, to phase out these particles. So, most of, many, many of these industries, the big ones mostly, they are phasing already out these particles with no evidence. I think that's one thing. So it's a good example of how the public opinion is enough um, to, um, to enforce these new measures so that uh, things change. And we sometimes don't think about that. We think that we need uh, lots of things. And uh, no, it's not. I mean, it, people that will think, wow, I'm washing my face with plastic. I don't want that. <laughs> so it's, it, some things are easier for some of us. Of course, when there is a problem, you don't have to waste a lot of time saying it's a problem because everybody realizes it. So. And the same with the plastic in your face, you don't want to be more. <laughs> so, some things are easier than others, but yeah, of course, we have, uh, we can do pressure to make things happen. Yeah, the same I, it was this morning that there was one session that was very interesting addressing some of these issues. Um, and under the blue economy perspective, they're always looking for opportunities for business. Paula mentioned very importantly that in terms of companies, they are seeing that as an opportunity to develop a new product that uh, from a societal perspective would be very valuable to them and they will buy it because they will feel better, not only get the product, but also know they are not polluting with microplastics. So like the World Trade Organization or the World Bank, so we're talking about the, the, the ones that have the money, uh, actually are looking at this as opportunities to support companies um, to develop a blue economy perspective in terms of sustainability on operating fisheries to uh, having businesses that minimize uh, plastic pollution. So all these different perspectives are being done from an industry perspective. One thing that, that I think should complement all of this is this perspective on capacity building that I think I should reinforce. If we're talking about businesses, they are happening now, but if you nurture the next generation of scientists and people, if they're informed, what is the status of the planet they will have a voice, much stronger voice on what they choose, or who should they vote, how should they live. If they're given that decisions, being more informed, they will be better citizens and we have a better planet. Now, what I see this week is that we are putting the economy, this different stakeholders. So it's not just the scientists talking to the policymakers to convince them. It's actually the stakeholders, the businesses, they are here to make money. And I don't think it's a problem, as long as it's good for the environment. We should take, we should engage all the stakeholders so that they're all part of the solution. If we just touch some parts of the society, the other ones will feel neglected and they won't care. 
And I think this week we're doing that in a very good way. Yes, I, I did. Um, I mean, uh, image can be extremely strong um, for the general public. I mean, if you still have an impactful um, image, yeah, uh, obviously, uh, image was more than uh, word. So, if you have uh, a strong image or impactful image, you can get the general public attention. And then you have an opportunity for a message that you want the public to, to reach the public. So, I think photography, video, and all these means of communication are an extremely important tool and it's, it's, being, for, uh, it's being used more and more uh, frequently to reach the general public and to address the specifics for that. And we have a few questions from our public at home, but uh, before we get to them, I just want to ask you, uh, it's just a curiosity, I'm sure that the tag on the shop said the only uh, attention is for 24 hours yeah. right now. Is that enough to get information? What kind of information well, do you just get from that? Well, they've got, uh, well, there's many different types of tags. That's the uh, short-term tag, it's just for um, well, short-term uh, information, to collect information. Basically, that tag collects information like um, precise location of the animal, uh, uh, depth, temperature, um, velocity, speed, so the velocity deceleration. So there's a lot of information that is basically to let us know a little bit more about the functional ecology, not just the movement. Is it is it discomfort? Or the, does it cause discomfort for the child? According to the, to the studies, it's not. Uh, doesn't cause discomfort, otherwise, we'd be a bite of information in that sort of Okay, thank you. Uh, so just to complement that, we will do a lot of tracking. What are the things that we can, um, not only what the animal does, but actually where you live? So, the temperature, like Nuno mentioned, the temperature, salinity. So, actually, you categorize very nicely the environment that actually is the habitat. So, if you touch, let's say we're talking about climate change. You could tell these sharks because you know the temperature changing. How what are the temperatures that are used to? So we mean from a conservation perspective, there will be a major advance. What we're doing now, of course, now the tax can be for example, GPS tells you exactly the uh, one meter error. But in the future, and Udo mentioned, they have solar panels, so they will last longer. The backgrounds are getting smaller. Yeah. We're so in stage already. Yeah. Perfect. So power, right? so that's so, amazing. So it means that now we get into a stage not only the next generation of technology, they will get smaller, smaller, lighter, and collect more data. And what we want in the future from an ocean perspective is to have satellite information on temperature. Any uh, <coughs> in situ locations uh, equipment. In real time, we'll tell you what is the temperature at 200 meters in Portugal. And we have other ones all around the world. So then you could create models that are saying how the actually the you know, in this case, all the oceans actually function in real time so that it can, how much is this warming? This is how much it's warming. Is affecting which, if this increases, which animals will be affected? Is it the sharks, is it the turtles? Is it all of them? Will we have impact on fisheries and other ecosystem services? All these interlinks will help, and this is the most important thing, and that's what we want to do this week as well, is if you analyze the oceans in, as one ocean, it could help Cabo Verde, it could help Portugal, it could help Brazil, all the countries that depends on this information. If you do it collectively, we will get the good data and good policies much quicker. Uh, are these technologies also being used to track the plastics, microplastics? Well, I think there are some projects being needed, but uh, for now, I don't know what we do But uh, I know that even NASA is uh, working on it, so I'm pretty sure that um, sometime, someday soon, something will come up that we can uh, track microplastics. Uh, at least at the surface of this, because I'm not so sure about. Uh, Subsurface, but well, at least it's a, yeah, but for the time being, you know, they can only detect like very huge impact. 
10 meter uh, uh, we have two questions from our audience at home. First one is from Ruben Austin. She has a second question for question to be for Ayurveda. How is crime against the ocean done? So, how is crime against the ocean done? So, I guess it's the pollution or the orange. Legal yeah, um, one yes, one hot topic is illegal fishing. This was already this morning put forward as as a something that the World Trading Organization has a new policy that they're actually trying to tackle and, and, and make. The, if you're trading, if you're going and uh, use your ships to go around, so that it could aid and support illegal fishing. Illegal or border? Yes, yes. They use why? Well, yes. I, when I'm talking illegal, out. Yeah, <laughs> I was too. Yeah, 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 and it's too unregulated. At all it's a, it's a big issue that that, that, that is very obvious that, that that is happening at the moment. And, and, oh, there's also a question. Sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's because it's the crime and the illegal stuff. Uh, I think that uh, government have to first try to resolve the illegal fishing in the small space of life. In the time of actually, we have. We have Illegal fishery, okay, and you have a uh, value, uh, and this is a small size. How do you get to resolve the illegal fishing in a developed, uh, developed country like Portugal in a small size? How are you going to resolve it, in, for instance, in, uh, in uh, Antarctica? In Antarctica. Okay, so, Which you, is you see what I'm saying? First, we have to resolve in a developed country that have money to resolve it, uh, and they have to have political. Uh, 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 will will the first in these and the try to resolve after that the beach and the ocean. Yes, ocean is real, real big. Okay, so if you can resolve 500 <laughs> guys here with the legal traffic, with the human traffic, then all you can resolve in boats and big problems. We can. That's a good thing. We can <laughs> because it's it's a it's a question of scale, but. Not only is different parts of the world, but some poor countries are very have already policies that actually are very efficient because people are more conscientious on the law. For example, the other one that the solve problem, let's say at this scale, uh, is actually to provide solutions rather than imposing laws and more policemen. Right, and, yeah, you provide solutions for the Antarctic, for example, because it's under the Antarctic Treaty. And it's ten percent of the planet, so it's talking about a huge. How are we going to regulate it? So we do. One of the solutions that we're working at the moment is using satellite imagery or tracking animals. So if you have tracking albatrosses, they cover huge areas. So they keep that pick up illegal the signal of the ships, the illegal ones. So they can send the information straight. That is illegal. So using the satellite actually can track the illegal ones. And each country, if they have ships around, they are policemen, policemen themselves. So we are having our own rules. Is it easy? It's not. But I, my suggestion is trying to solve it in a very collective way. Right. Large scale, small scale, middle scale, any scale. <laughs> but I think it's possible to, to solve it. But it's true. We need to, to make sure that we work together with all the stakeholders to make sure that we get a solution. Whatever the whatever the problem is. So essentially we think of the end Yes, I think so too. I agree with you. Okay. Uh, we have another question. This one is from Sonia. She asks, what are the main challenges that society must face? Will it be enough to save what is left of the larger planet? So essentially, are we doing enough and what are the challenges that we will have to face uh, in the next uh, decades? Maybe uh, start with Mark. Well, I think we can answer with that question already, but because it's uh, what are the challenges? The challenges are um, indifference, I would say, would be the, the main one, indifference, because I mean, there's so much information now, all the diagnosis have been done, so we cannot ignore them now. So uh, I, think, uh, I think it's time to, to act, and we don't really need more information to be. Doing something. Of course, we also we always need more information for science and for understanding processes and things like that. But there are many 
main information, lots of information that is already there. So uh, it's, uh, I think we should, uh, we cannot ignore, and ignoring is indifference. And how do, do we fight the difference? For example, um, this, this question is for all of you. Um, for a long time, uh, when we talked about climate change, uh, it was in a sense of what we call doomism. Mm -hmm. Everything is going wrong, and there, there's little that we can do to stop it. And that made people, not too many people, governments, companies, actually. How can we change uh, this message of doom to a message of hope? That can actually make people get out of their seats and do something to, to try and make a change. Um, I don't know, we're showing good examples. There are some great examples of worldwide to tackle um, climate change, overfishing, pollution. I mean, there's so much stuff going on uh, worldwide, and, and so many organizations working together and creating solutions and actually having uh, amazing results to tackle all these uh, problems. So I think we have to uh, basically uh, uh, lead by example and follow these amazing examples. So that's, that's, that's a big part of it, that's the whole education. Mm. I, I, I would just complement that. I totally agree with both. Um, one of the key things is when we look at a problem globally, it gets overwhelmed and we freeze and we say we can't do anything. So my first step that we should do is like your efforts, act locally and make sure you have an impact in a global scale. If you assess your individual impact and then your community, then your city, then your country, then the world, if you assess and start from that step, what can I do? Okay, would I have managed coming from the conference walking to here? I'll just let the metro. Instead of a taxi, I could have got a taxi <laughs> and stay there later. But just just little things. So what I suggest is what we dress, what we eat. You know, there's already a lot of discussions. Uh, what should we what should we, should we leave our computer on? If it's more efficient or not. There's a lot of discussions. How many megabytes? How much energy consumes after a year? You know, so even making less that guilty at that level. So what I find, I totally agree with Daniel. It's we have to be positive. I felt I was discussing that with you this morning. I really find found that from the governments, they are addressing the problems, but they are really keen to let's do it together. This is our chance. Let's be positive. It's big problems, but if you, everyone does their little bit, there's hope. And now we have the technology. And I would like to add this is. The, the technology is part of the solution, but shouldn't allow you as a society to say the technology is there, so we don't need to do anything. Exactly. And that's not how it is. Solution uh, technology is there to help you. We have all these efforts to address the economy issues, have the companies, have societies, but act first on you as an individual. Start like that, and then see how you build up. And also listen to the different organizations that are involved in understanding these issues that can be addressed and how they can do these solutions together. But little steps. If not, we just get frozen and it's too overwhelming. Yes, yes, I totally agree with you. Because it's the same thing. I mean, when I think of uh, uh, people changing their, their lives, their habits, or not using plastic, or sometimes they are, I mean, we use plastic so much that. They have to do so many things at the same time that they freeze exactly. They say, no, I'm never going to be able to do this. It's not for me. But instead, if they do small steps, uh, change this today, tomorrow, another thing, and contaminate it to go around them, and I think that's the best way to go. I mean, a step at, at a time, even if it's taking long, I mean, maybe it's going to take longer, but it's more effective because otherwise people will just. No, no, I cannot do that. Mm -hmm. Maybe not. Mm -hmm. uh, we will run out of time, but I'll give you each one of you one minute for any uh, final messages that you might have to use that. Okay. okay. Uh, well, um, basically, just like, like, like I said in the beginning, I'm, I'm optimistic about this, this conference. Not too optimistic, but, uh, <coughs> but optimistic. I think there's a, a lot of stuff going on that is moving in the right directions. And like uh, we're creating uh, bridges that 
will be absolutely crucial for the future of, of our planet and our ocean. Um, and honestly, it's just a just a, a final message to to all of us. When we we're just discussing what can each of us do to be better in order to work towards a better future. Uh, just start just start by being a conscious consumer. For example, you go to the supermarket. There's everything is labeled as what Western countries, which is uh, what we're talking, and we're based at. So we can do a lot of stuff that some people in the Western countries or ordinary countries or poor countries are not able to do. So everything is labeled nowadays. Why why we why why should we buy fish that comes from trolling fishing? Why should we get something that comes from uh, lemons from South Africa or oranges from Florida that we get by local? Step by step, just to act local. Um, I would just use the word hope. I'm very hopeful for this week. Um, I really like the the atmosphere that is surrounding Lisbon and how the United Nations conference is actually working. And I, I'm very hopeful for, for the future. I think we are in the right track. We need to go faster, quicker. There's definitely urgency on the actions that we need to take. It will, it will be painful, but we need to do them. And I think we have the right people and the right information. We just need to do it. Well, at first I was a bit, uh, not very, uh, I, I mean, I've been conscious like this before, but I think, well, this is going to be again a little bit not going to be this anywhere. But in fact, I feel, I feel, um, I feel optimistic now. Maybe because I'm surrounded by so many people that uh, create this sensation of being able to really do something against uh, against time and against what is happening to the, the planet. So um, I, I have also have a message of, of hope, uh, and uh, well, I don't really know what to so. say. <laughs> well, uh, this concludes our session. Thank you to all of you for being here and sharing your experiences. And well, to everyone that's been watching us at home, I hope you enjoyed our session and uh, have a great conference. Bye bye. bye. <laughs>